Hey everybody, welcome into this crazy Zoom room. You know, I had a realization a few days ago because I thought this room was magical, but it really isn't the room that's magical because the room on its own, the Zoom room, it's just a blank room. It's just two empty spaces. What becomes magical is what happens when people come into this room and start to have a conversation. And what's even more interesting to me is that how people that are complete strangers, we don't know each other from Adam or Eve. And before <laughs> Karen DeMarco walked into this room, I didn't really didn't even know that she existed. So, but she signed up for this, for this conversation, as did hundreds and hundreds of other people. And I'm just having the time of my life sitting and, and listening to people. I have one agenda in this room and one agenda only. That's to love and accept the people that come into this room. That's to listen to them and let them know that what they say I've heard. And it's to acknowledge and validate them. That's all that has to happen. That's all that I want. And so with that in mind, I guess I, I, I understand why people want to come and have a conversation. Because so rarely do we feel even listened to and heard, let alone acknowledged and validated, let alone loved and accepted. Why am I doing this, Karen asked me in the green room. Why do I, why do, I do this? It's a perfect lead in to the sponsor of, my, of this show. I wrote the book over my left shoulder called The Mosaic and they're sponsoring the show. The Mosaic's a story about a boy who loses his parents two years apart on the same day. And when he asks the adults, where are my parents go? What, what, what did that happen to them? Where are they? The adults tell them they went to a place called heaven. So the little boy in missing his parents so much sets out in search of the place called heaven. And the people that he meets along his journey are not the clergy and the wise ones and the rabbis and priests and ministers and shamans and his swamis and gurus, but rather common ordinary people. They're the road worker and the trash man, the blind woman and the homeless guy, the gardener and the juice man and the waitress and the traveler. And he sits and wonders, why am I meeting these people? They don't seem like the ideal people to show me heaven. Why would I be meeting them? But he says, I'm here with them, so why don't I just sit and listen to what they have to say? And when he sits and listens to them tell their story, what he realizes is in 100% of the cases, who they are is completely different than the person he initially thought they were when he looked at them. He looked at the homeless man and didn't think at all that what he got from what the story, the story of the homeless man was who that person was. And so when he realized that over and over and over again, he wondered, do I see anything in this world the way it is? Or do I see everything just the way I am? And I wonder what would happen if I slid myself to the left or to the right, got out of the way and saw the world as it is. I wonder if that's even possible. And the moment he tried to slide himself out of the way, he looked to his right and he saw a monk unzipping the sky and inviting him to walk through the sky into a parallel reality where he met the wise one who was the keeper of the mosaic. That's, my sponsor would be very happy if that story enticed you to go out and get a copy of the mosaic. It's available on Amazon or on my website. All those links will be in the show notes. And now that my sponsor is happy, let's have our conversation. It's my joy and privilege. I like this woman from the moment I saw her. We've only, we only met three minutes ago in the green room. <laughs> There's something about her that makes her compelling, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Karen DeMarco, welcome to the conversation. How are you today? Likewise, Danny. I'm fantastic. And you know what I started calling the Zoom room? No. Zoom. Doesn't that sound like a Zoom? I'll see you in the Zoom. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like a magical word? Yes. Well, it actually was. when I, In the 60s, I did, I did shrooms, mushrooms, and they were magical. So I like that. Yeah. Well, I've, I've re-engaged in that uh, psychonautic, adventure, <laughs> psychonautic adventure of, of late after reading uh, Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind and 
Uh, chasing the scream is another good one about. So are you and, doing uh, microdosing or what are you doing? I haven't yet, but I want to try. I've been I've oh, been okay, looking cool. at it. No, <laughs> we'll just go. We'll just get right into it. No, it was about. It was about um, 18 months ago. I read, you know, I, I read those books and just got really curious. You know, like yeah, there was you know the college experience is when it was recreational. But what if, what as an adult, as a 45 year old woman and got together a group of no, I, I did a course online about how to um, the California Institute for Noetic Sciences, I think yeah. it actually has a year long course where because there's so much research being done. So they need people basically they're, it's like a Western shaman, right? I mean, so they're there. So I haven't gone through that course, but I did an online course by um, anyway, learned kind of how to facilitate and got like eight adults, you know, most of us had wow. had that that college experience. Some had never had the experience, but were really curious. And man, <laughs> had a ball. So those those adventures will continue. But um, fabulous. Now I want the listener to understand. I know Karen all of about three minutes. And look at the look at the depth of the conversation and where we've already gone in the first three minutes, right? So I want you to just see what's possible when you just open up yourself. To invite people to tell you what's on their mind and what they're thinking and where that conversation can go and how much similarities we share with each other with when, when we don't even know it. Karen was a stranger to me, but already she's becoming a friend because we already have things in common and share some things that we're doing and might do in the future. So how cool is that? It's really cool. And I think um, when, when you come from a place, I call it the gap, there's who, here's who you truly are and here's who the world told you you ought to be oh, wow. and when that gap close, closes and we share from that space there is no there's no small talk there's no need for that you just go right into the deep end of the pool <laughs> i love it i love it yeah. well apparently we've closed that gap my friend um i'm going to ask you what seems like a simple question but instead of giving me the simple answer, I want to I want to put a subset around the question because it's so easy to ask how are you and for people to say fine, great, good, you know, mm -hmm. and, go on, and go on to the next question. But we got a lot of shit going down. Pardon my language. We got a global pandemic. We got a civil rights movement. We've got a we've got a Me Too movement that's that's gaining steam still. We have people that are coming out from all sectors saying you can't treat me like this anymore. It's not. We're people too, and we have a right to be seen and heard and, and, and appreciated for who we are, not just things for you to play with as sexual toys or not things, not things for you to use to do your chores for you. Um, we have most of our mainstay institutions. I'm talking about education, medical, business, uh, just about anywhere you want to take a look seems to be decaying and being looked at with new eyes. How are you doing in this world that we're living in right now? Well, just before I got on with you, I was having a big boo-hoo pity party. Well, I'm much better now because the refractory period <laughs> seems to be, you know, I, I keep describing it as a feeling like I'm in the fast lane on the highway behind somebody going 35 and won't get out of the way. Wow. It's like, come on, <laughs> you know? Um, but that's, if I could use a metaphor for how I'm doing, that's it. It's wow. just like, um, you know, I want my freedom of movement and emotion and it's just freedom back. I want to go as fast as I want. I want to go as slow as I want. I don't want anybody to tell me how fast or slow I can go. And before I got um, did this call, the boohoo was about, I have a, a dear friend of mine who's over in, he's Irish and he's over in Belgium. And um, he was going to spend, you know, the summer here. We were going to go to a surf camp in Costa Rica, you know, meet my brother in Costa Rica with this guy. And we we're going to, and, and, you know, that got put on hold. And, and now there's no, end in sight and yeah. i think that's what what that being behind a slow car in the fast lane feeling is there's no you know it's just like this limbo feeling and you're you know where's where's the edge where's yeah. the edge of this fishbowl you know it's an it's a invisible prison and it's all of our mind i know this you know yeah. but so 
can I share a story with you from the mosaic quickly? Please, please yeah. I, I'm, I, I can't believe I haven't already gone on. It seems like it would be rude to go on Amazon right now and get it, but yeah, tell your sponsor, sell, sold. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> so let me introduce you to one of the characters because you seem to be talking about one of the characters and I just want to get your point of view on this, okay? One of the characters that Mo meets after his, his dad dies and his, his, his dad left his family in a mountain full of debt. So as a kid, he has to just go out because his mom is overburdened with the fact that she's lost her husband, the love of her life, and hasn't is in this debt. So Mo decides, I'm going to go out as a kid who has no idea how to do anything and find something to do and find a job. And he walks, instead of going towards the town, he walks away from the town, which is a mile into it. He was wondering what kind of idiot would walk away from the town when all the jobs would be there rather than on a country road. And he's starting to doubt himself and think he can't do anything and who's ever going to hire him and why would they hire him? He's just a kid. He doesn't have any idea what to do. And suddenly in the distance, he starts to hear a jackhammer going and, and he is so happy because he, he sees somebody's going to be there and he's going to get to see somebody after miles and miles of walking without seeing anybody. And he comes upon the road worker and the road worker looks at him and sees he's distraught and says, are you doing okay? And Mo says what well, we all do, or most of us do. Yeah, I'm fine. But his, his dad just passed away, and so he's not fine. And he doesn't know how he can ask the road worker for a job because he doesn't have any idea how to do it, and it looks like hard work. And he says, no, I'm really not. After that, he says, no, I'm really not that fine. And the road worker said, yeah, I got a sense that you were. What's going on? And he stops his jackhammer, and he sits with him and talks to him, and it turns out, he tells him the story of the road worker and how he wakes up early in the morning and works till late at the night. And no matter how big a road is, how beautiful, how cur curvy or straight, every road over time gets a pothole. And he watches what happens when the road gets a pothole because every road gets it. But what interests him is not only the pothole, but how the people approach the pothole. Some people see the pothole from a distance and drive around it. And nothing happens. They're all the, they encountered it. They found their way around it and got out of it. Some people drive into the pothole, ruin the whole front end of their car, go off to the shop, get the car fixed. And all but for a few dollars and a little bit of time inconvenience, inconvenience they're pretty much back to life as usual. The third group of people drive into the pothole, ruin the front end of their car, and hope no one will notice. But everybody notices, and they walk around saying how fine they are and how good they are when the whole front of their of their car is hanging. And we let I think you laugh because we know some of those people, right? Who just they we can feel that something's not quite right, but they don't acknowledge that that is and want to hold up this facade that everything's fine. But the person that interests him the most, and this is where I was getting to a little bit is the one that drives into the pothole and forgets the road that brought him there was luxurious and beautiful. And the road five, five kilometers ahead or five meters ahead is again, curvy and beautiful and exquisite, but he gets stuck in the pothole and he tries to get out and he can't get out. He wonders if he'll ever get out of the pothole, if it will ever end, if it will always be like this. And he starts to make his reality based on the fact that he's in this pothole and it will never change. And he said, the road worker said, those are the ones that interest me the most, partly because I have to get them out of the pothole in order to fix it, but partly because how could they forget how beautiful the road was that, they, that brought them here and how beautiful the road still is ahead of us. I believe most of the world that we live in right now is in one edge of that pothole or another that most of us have gone into that pothole and wondered, just like yourself, when will this ever end? Will it ever end? How can it ever end? And I just want to invite the road worker to come into this conversation now. And I want him to let you know that he, he, you've got, he's got to help you get out of this pothole. Not that you're in it, but anybody who's listening to it, he's got to help you get out because he can't fix it with you in there. He ends up hiring Mo, just so you know the story, and Mo works with him for a while until he realizes that the problem he thought he was solving was a big problem that he wasn't solving, and, he, and then he has to leave. Tell me your thoughts on that story. 
as you're, I'm like, there's something really beautiful about being in the pothole though. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, it's like you're, you're spelunking in the unknown, you know? Um, so already I think you've made up more words than I think I've ever had on anything <laughs> in the room. And we're only a few minutes into it. You're spelunking in the cave of uncharted human territory. You know, like I said, you know, I think for those of us, well, like for me, not being afraid to have the boot who, you know, that's, that's the tree that bends in the wind, you know, not being afraid to let yourself get overwhelmed and let yourself have the boohoo and let yourself feel like you're, uh, yeah. and then, then when you, when you don't resist that, Oh, we got to fix this. So I don't have to feel that fear in the unknown. When you just kind of roll with it, then you can get on with a stranger five minutes later, you know, put a little makeup on, <laughs> you can go ahead and tell them, you know, tell them you just were bawling your eyes out a half hour earlier. And, and, and there's something, about being in the pothole together yeah you know yeah and um so I, yeah I, I i love the story but then i was i was getting curious while you're talking about the pothole so i love that you love that and i want to remind you how we came into this story because you felt like you were driving on the on the fast lane behind someone going 35 miles an hour yeah so i understand when we sit in the pothole and and accept the pain of the pothole and accept the limitations of the pothole and accept and deal with it but what about that person that's driving that's driving in the fast lane that wants to go 70 75 80 and someone's 135 in there well can i tell you a story please okay well this is this is how this is why i'm not afraid of that feeling either it was um last year first day of school when there still was school, <laughs> right? right. Uh, I have three kids, um, just spent very busy summer with them and all that stuff. And um, I got them all, drove them all to school. Here was my outfit. I had uh, pink, light pink sweatpants on. I'm only five foot one. So anything I wear is all tattered and torn and dirty at the bottom, right? I had fuzzy gray socks on inside of black sparkly flip flops tank top on no bra bedhead hair because i'm thinking well, i'm just getting in the car to drive the kids to school you know i i don't really care that i look like a complete right. basket case <laughs> um drop them off and i kind of all of a sudden got really sad drop them off at school and there's kind of this void so i go into starbucks like i was and uh, take my coffee home and all of a sudden i get into the kitchen i see the himalayas of dishes and piles of laundry that need folding and all of this stuff. And I had per, per, uh, purposefully kept the last two weeks of work quiet. So I didn't have really any work planned that day. No friends, because I'm new to the area. It's all my friends, I have friends all over the world. They're all thousands of miles away, but no one local. And I was like, <laughs> I'm a loser. Just <laughs> looking, looking at my fuzzy socks. I remember looking at the fuzzy socks and the black sparkly, having the boohoo being in the pothole, being in the fast lane behind someone going, all those feelings. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what woke me up, but something woke me up. I think it was actually the bumpers on the side of the highway. You know, I'm, 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 I'm very sad and an unhappy loser right now and lonely and no friends. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute, I don't have any work today. I don't have any kids around. I can wear whatever I want and no one will care. I can, I can watch a movie. I could go to a movie like, like that. Yeah. Nothing about my outside circumstances had changed. Yeah. I was still wearing the same outfit. I was still in an empty house. I still have no friends, but my entire experience of that changed in an instant. Yeah. And it's the same up and down with this whole pandemic pothole thing. You know, I know that when I'm having that feeling, that very frustrated, sad, when is this ever gonna end feeling? I'm only a thought away or a different story away from a completely different experience. Yeah. And how many times during this pandemic has that happened to people? Like I can say for me, it's like, oh, I don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> you know, to yeah. I can't go anywhere. Oh, I don't have to go anywhere because yeah. I can't. I love what you're saying. And it's really just in line with what the mosaic is talks about also, which is a change of perspective changes everything. I think Wayne Dyer, I remember sitting with him one day and we were just talking and then he ended up saying what I said, what we were talking about in front of people. And it became one of his taglines. 
and that was um, when you change the way you see the world, the world you see changes. Yeah. And a perspective shift is, is everything. And that's what the mosaic is all about. So I, I can't wait for you to get it because I want to hear how you experience it and what goes on. I love that. And I love Wayne Dyer was like my gateway drug into all this. I love you know. I love <laughs> what makes you happy? Making people laugh. And usually that's really easy when just some semantics i mean naked nude is without clothing naked is like you know uh to be vulnerable naked to mine enemies shakespeare you know right um so when you're naked with somebody it's hilarious yeah and i call myself now a professional standard lowerer i mean really my job is so easy like all i do is sh share my humanness my nakedness it not only makes people crack up but it usually has one of two effects on people it either makes them go, Oh, thank God I'm not her. You know, I thought I was doing bad. <laughs> thank God I'm not whore or more often than not. It's, um, me too. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that makes me extremely happy. Just being <laughs> getting naked with people. <laughs> so if you were in a room by yourself and there was nobody else around, would you be unhappy? No. <laughs> How come? Because I like my own company. <laughs> okay. So when I ask you what makes you happy and you beautifully say it's bringing happiness to other people, even though if no one was around, you would still find a way to make you happy. So what makes you happy? Really going around the houses here, Danny. Um, <laughs> what makes me happy? What if I can't really answer that question with, I mean, I, I, I still hold to my first one. I mean. Right. But you would um, be happy if no one was around and you couldn't make anybody happy. You'd still be happy. So, cause you enjoy your own company. So what actually is it that makes you happy? Sure. You're happy when you make people happy, but there's something underneath that. It sounds like that you're happy, even if you couldn't do that. So what is the thing that makes you happy? And you don't have to answer it. It's just interesting. Yeah, it's yeah, it's no, it's, a, it's an interesting. It's a great question, but it's it's um, it's it's more like I am happy. I love that. And and when I'm out of my own way, it's 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 always there, you know. So I guess when I'm not getting in the way of it, I am happy. Can you, <laughs> you hear know? the difference in those answers? I mean, I um, know there. Well, yes, yeah, something extrinsic bringing a smile to my face and then just being happiness. Yeah. One, in yeah. one case, you said it's when I do this for other people. In the other case, you said, I'm just always happy. And yeah. Well, I, I think, way. yes, sir. I think because when I'm my, my first answer, my second answer feels more true, but yeah. the first answer is kind of the same because it's may, maybe the case is when I'm making someone else smile or sharing from that place, it gets all the other BS out of the way of. Yeah, I agree with that. I understand. Yeah. So two approaches to the same way, but it's not dependent on someone else being there, which is just interesting. I'm a wordsmith sort of because I'm a writer. And so I look at the way people phrase things. Yeah. And I felt from you that your happiness came from another place other than that only. So what's important to you? You want to get a little existential? <laughs> What's yeah, important to me? Fine. Um, uh, everything I go to say, <laughs> um, I, I, I feel like I'm looking for ways in my life for that to be less important. So huh. maybe what's really important is taking life less seriously less seriously more and more you know uh, what i mean yeah totally. like 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 people people seem to and i i'm one of the i know i get lost in this too but people take not taking life so seriously very seriously right. yeah. you know what i, I mean love it. i love it <laughs> um yeah and i i'm you know i used to like live from that space and still get caught up in it once in a while but i think um what's important to me is just releasing burden you know being that ha being that happiness more and more 
without needing stuff. <laughs> so I want to bring the listener in and I want to just ask the listener, as you listen to Karen speak, can you feel how authentic it is? Can you feel how we don't know each other from Adam or Eve, right? Like we already said, but listen to how real she's talking. I love how you include Eve. Yeah, why not? I mean, there's a Me Too movement going on. So <laughs> um, but listen to how authentic she is and how real she is and how there's no defensiveness. When I ask her, it would have been so easy for her to get defensive and say, well, I told you already what makes me happy, right? But there's no defensiveness there because well, rather than me say why, because why, why aren't you defensive when I'm asking you these questions? Oh, um, because I'm curious. I love your questions. I mean, I think if anybody who um, is not worried, the thing that has made the biggest difference in my life, in my health, in my ability to access my happy, <laughs> if you want to call it that. I love is, that is um, finding the courage to be disliked. Yeah. You know, uh, finding the courage to be vulnerable and not have it right or not have it perfect. Because when you come to somebody from that angle, then you're not worried about putting on a mask or a face or saying the right thing. Yeah. But when you can get curious, because the more you f find out about yourself, who am I? And those questions you're asking are really wise and powerful. You know, when you're, you're if you're, somebody being asked that question who's willing to get it wrong or be vulnerable or look a little deeper, um, then you get more goodies out of yourself. You know, you get, you get more goodies out of life. So what was your original question? What, what allows me to answer them without being defensive? Yeah. I mean, Cause I, yeah. Because I know I'm going to learn something if I, you know, I love if that. I'm not trying to get it right. So one of the, one of the way, secrets to me of being able to be able to listen to people and hear people and being accepting of people and, and loving them is that I come into the room without an agenda. Like there, nothing you could say would be right or wrong to me. It's just what you believe. And I want to know what you believe. When I have an agenda to say, no, you shouldn't believe like that. You should believe like I believe. Then that messes up everything. And that happened to me in, in one of my first calls. I was talking with someone who was a born again Christian and I was, I was you know, uh, one day away from being ordained an Orthodox rabbi. So I loved those conversations. And it, it was a great conversation, but it wasn't a great conversation for this room because I came in with an agenda to show her that what the way she was seeing it, that it wasn't the way she was saying it, that it was a bigger way than she was seeing it. And I felt really bad for her. I called her up and I apologized and, uh, to her for doing that. And, and even in my show notes, I apologized for the way I showed up because that wasn't what I want. It was a fun conversation, but not for this room. And so I find similar to what you're saying, when, when there's no worry about being right or wrong, but just sharing ourselves that, why do we have to be right all the time or wrong all the time? We don't have to. We can just say what we believe and listen to what other people think and, and hear it. And if what they think has value to us, we adapt to it. If it doesn't, then we don't adapt to it. We just, you know, it's so, it seems so easy. Um, do you feel people listen to, to each other? Do you feel people listen to each other? I I think it's a skill. I think, and I, and I, you know, I, I saw this in myself for much of my life. I was listening. People either listen to agree or listen to negate, but very few people will just sit there and listen. Yeah. You know, without waiting for the person to put a period on the end of their sentence so then they can go, you know? And I think that's, um, yeah, that's, that's a skill, but it's so, so few people have actually been listened to like that, that it's amazing how cathartic it is and how they feel it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. How I, it is. I love to hear you say that because that's the experience of this room somehow that in the process of, of being heard, people no longer need to defend themselves. And a lot of the armor that they come in with falls down and, 
sometimes they see themselves for the first time. They didn't even, they haven't even shown themselves themselves. And it's amazing to me, the comments that I get from people sometimes after being in the conversation and I didn't do anything. I just sat and listened to people. I didn't like, it wasn't, I wasn't teaching anything. I wasn't sharing it. I was just listening. It reminds me of an old Simon and Garfunkel song, sounds of silence, people, people listening without hearing, you know, we listen, but we don't really hear. And, um, so I think you asked, why am I doing this? Because when I finished the mosaic, the mosaic told me to go out and do what Mo did. Go out on the, on the road and speak to the people that nobody speaks to and listen to the people nobody listens to. And originally I thought that was the downtrodden. Originally I thought that was the homeless. Originally I thought that was the people that had no power to have a voice. But I was sitting doing my work and my wife came into the room and she said something to me. I said, yeah, honey, I think that's a great idea. Mm. And she said, Danny, look at me. And I looked at her, she said, you didn't hear a word I said, did you? <laughs> and I said, no, I really didn't. I'm so sorry. Hold it, let me put this down. She said, oh, the great listener doesn't even hear his wife. And I realized mm, very few of us feel listened to. Even my own wife didn't feel listened to. And, we, and that's a big, that's a big uh, value that we, sh that we put into our relationship that we want to hear each other and listen to each other and be there for each other. So I went to, into the offices of the business world and I would talk to the CEOs of the companies and I would say, do you feel listened to? And they said, well, we can't tell people what we actually think. They'll never, they won't respect us. And I went, okay. And I went to the employees and I said, do you feel listened to? And they said, no, we can't say what we think people. If we tell people what they, they think, they'll use it to, to hurt us. And so, I went to my stepson and I said, do you feel, do you feel like your teachers in school listen to you? And he said, no, I'm a square peg. They're trying to push me into a round hole. They don't listen to me. They don't even have an idea what to do with me. And so I realized listening, there's a, there's a pandemic of lack of listening going on. And I wanted to create a window where people could see what would happen when people actually felt heard that it's possible, that it's easy, that it's not hard. And I wanted to create that and create a revolution of listening where we actually start to listen more to each other. Make sense? It's beautiful and I think could be the serum that affects such, could affect such great change, not even just listening to one another, but listening, learning to listen to ourselves first. Yeah. You know, so very few people listen, know who they are. Yeah. I, I like to say that I think before anyone takes marriage vows to another, yeah. they should take them to themselves. I love that. I, Karen, take you, Karen, to be my forever love. I promise to be true to you. I because love. we don't listen to our own. We listen to what the world told us we ought to be and do that. And we have this internal divide. And my, my Irish friend I was talking about earlier, he always says, when people don't feel heard, they just get louder. Yeah. So when we listen to each other, like I think as humans, we all basically want the same thing because we're made of the same stuff. Yeah. We want the same thing. We might have different ideas of how to get there, but we want the same thing. Peace, yeah. love, happiness, right? Yeah. So if we listen to one another's ideas, knowing that we all want the same thing and aren't again against each other and we can listen to ourselves listen to one another look at what what could happen listen what if countries you know like people of, of who are warring of different religions if they knew in their hearts they all wanted the same thing but had different ideas of how to get there we're all the same then what would be the need for yeah well, war you know karen demarco you are a spokeswoman for the mosaic in, a, in the most beautiful way, because that is the mosaic. That's everything the mosaic's about. That's everything it's trying to bring to the world. And so under separate, oh, I love that. Under separate cover, I would like to talk to you to see how we can engage in, and, and play together in that, because you, you grokked it immediately. And it's exactly what's going on. So I well, promise I'm not a plant, anyone. <laughs> that's right. <yeah. laughs> why do you think that people don't listen to themselves? 
because they've been told since the age of learning of understanding language is that, that they're wrong and they don't know. Wow. I mean, we're, you know, well-meaning adults and mentors who were taught the same thing, you know, from a very, like, I mean, listen to the messages. Boys don't cry. That's not ladylike. Yeah. Clean your plate, but I'm not hungry. doesn't matter. Clean your plate. But, you know, you're, you're constantly told that you don't know that your, your internal GPS, uh, the thing within is wrong. So yeah. you learn to not listen to that because you're told your whole life that it's wrong. Wow. And listener, can you relate to what Karen's saying? Can you hear can you hear how true the words she's saying are? Can you hear what we do and how we're programmed to not trust ourselves, not believe that we have answers, not believe anything? And look, I um I'm remarried now. My wife passed away. I'm remarried. I have a developmentally delayed daughter, which we can talk about another time. My daughter, my wife has two children, an 18-year-old boy and a 16-year-old girl. Well, when they came, they were going through those times. And our, our, my stepdaughter, to still this degree, is very much like me. She thinks she knows everything, and especially at 15 or years old, she thinks she knows everything. And so there's a part of me that would love her to know that she doesn't know everything because she doesn't know everything. She knows what she knows, which isn't everything. But I love what you're saying because I'm going to revisit the conversations I have with her. Because just because she doesn't see the whole picture doesn't mean she doesn't see the picture. But I know... May I offer something that might Please. be helpful? Because I have three teenage Please. girls. Please. Um, I, it's really scary as a parent to let go because we're programmed that we know better. And, and I'm just going to give you this one example. I, we, I moved again. I've moved like 16 times in 19 years or something like that. So two years ago, I moved again. And I was, you know, I run my own business, kind of single parenting, you know, doing the single, single mom thing uh, for three girls and whatever, and reading all this stuff about tech on their phones all the time, you know, technology, technology, and this Snapchat thing was breaking my heart, you know, like they're, they got to keep these streaks and I'm like yelling at them and resisting what they're doing and whatever. I, I couldn't do it anymore. Like I, I couldn't, I couldn't worry. I had my own stuff to, I had to get my own oxygen mask on first before I put it on others. Right. So I just forgot it. I'm like, you know what? It's nothing therapy won't fix. <laughs> I just, just let them have at it with the whole technology thing. And there they go off to the races. You know, there's no put it down for an hour blocking. I, I just, it's, it's their business. And wouldn't you know it because they have access to the internet because they were spending so much time on their phone and their mom wasn't telling them what to do. Something within them went, oh, this doesn't feel good. And then they're also seeing things themselves being drawn to things online that says, this is bad for the dopaminergic pathway in your brain and whatever, and how much damage it can do. And they voluntarily, without me telling them what to do, something very powerful within them told them, not good, put it down. And then they owned it. And here's the other little fun thing. Because they have access to the things they have access I put on Alan Watts. I had Alan Watts playing in my car. And my then 15 year old goes, Hey mom, that's Alan Watts. I'm like, you don't know who Alan Watts is. She's like, Oh yeah, I love him. I fall asleep to him. Actually, he says it's coming kind of the same shizzle that you say, mom. I fall asleep to him every night. I love his voice. Turns out that day I'm my then, sorry, that's 15. So my then 13 year old and 11 year old hear me saying to my mom or whoever I was talking to on the phone, yeah, can you believe Gianna's listening to Alan Watts? And they're like, oh, I love Alan Watts. The 11 year old and the 13 year old. I love that. I didn't find him until my mid thirties. Right. So it's scary, you know, and yeah, yeah. we're kind of do this yeah. thing, but I really feel like the same thing that makes the trees know to bloom in spring and lose their leaves in fall, you know, and the, and the same thing that, beats our heart and digests our food and <laughs> the lion doesn't look at the antelope go mm, I just ate yesterday maybe I shouldn't have seconds okay. you right. know and the antelope doesn't wonder if it'd be rude to run right 
you know, we, we all, man is part of nature, not apart from nature. And there's this very powerful thing when left to its own devices. Maybe I think so. I hope it's scary. Maybe knows better than I do. I love everything you're saying. And I thank you for sharing all of that. I love, love, love that. And again, I want to just bring the listener in. I didn't know this woman at all. I didn't even know she existed. And everything she's saying resonates completely with me. And so how is that possible? That someone who I would have walked by on the street and thought they're just a stranger. When I spent what, like a minute and a half? I mean, now it's been 45 minutes, but we spent about a minute and a half. And already there was this friendship there that might not have even taken a minute and a half. <laughs> I want to invite you all to just do the same thing. Take a moment and just reach out to someone you don't know, whether that's online or in person, and open up a conversation. All you have to do is start by saying, how are you? And you don't need to fix them or change them or help them or, or elevate them or convert them. Just try being there for them and see what happens. I love, love, love this conversation. Me too. Do you feel like you're heard? I do now. <laughs> I, I, um, I am so blessed in my life to have people like you who know how to listen. And, and not only, and they're not doing it as a favor, they do it because they get as much out of it as I do, you know, yeah. listening as to being listened to. How, for people who don't feel heard, do you have any ideas how they would go about finding those people that you're blessed to have all around you? Yeah. Learn to listen to yourself first. Beautiful. And those people will come into your life automatically because you won't be able to tolerate, you know, it, not when you learn to listen to yourself, then not listening to yourself becomes intolerable. Yeah. So then not being heard by the people you surround yourself also becomes intolerable, but there's nothing you really have to do because it seems like life just kind of, you would start attracting those kinds of souls to you. So there's only one thing to do and it's start listen, learning to listen to yourself. Do you feel a trend developing in the way Karen's speaking that it's a very Taoist way of looking at life, that the earth left, by on, left to itself will correct everything that's wrong with it and that you don't need to correct your kids. You, you just need to be there and love them and accept them and be there for them. And they'll come in their own time to their own knowledge that you don't need to search out people who will listen to you. That if you listen to yourself and, and hold the space, that those people will be drawn to you without you having to do anything. It sort of makes the importance of us a little less important, right? Which is sort of where she started out by saying what's important to her is people not being so serious about not being serious. You know, <laughs> I, I, and, and I love the theme of how, of how it's all developed. What are you most scared of? <laughs> there's not, there's not much. I, I would say I'm, there's always going to be that, um, like, I'm, I'm not afraid of dying. Like, we have crazy conversations at our dinner table. You ask me what I am afraid of, and I'm telling you what I'm not afraid of, but it's funny. At my dinner table with my kids, we will have, let's explore death conversations. Like, oh my gosh, that must be such an awful way to die. And I've, you know, been a nurse for 25 years, and I've seen a lot of people die. I'm like, really? Not that bad. Because, like, drowning. Not that bad because you know after that initial panic and you kind of <gasps> breathe in you kind of just float off how about being burned burned alive i think that you're probably already out of there and watching your body scream but yeah. i don't think i said i think someone comes to get you yeah pretty quick you know i said like i think the universe is really friendly on that when i've, I've read enough near-death experience <laughs> books to know yeah. you know so we'll get these arguments so it's not what most people are afraid of um but there's that hardwired into my genes um, desire to be liked, approved of, you know, so that Ankh doesn't kick you out of the tribe. We all give out, 
we all give out to ourselves so much like, oh, I wish I didn't care so much about what people thought of me. Well, good luck with that. I think it's kind of hardwired. So I, I would I would say that I will, here, here it is. I had to go around the house just to, to answer the question. I'm afraid that that thing that's so powerful that still I'm, I'm going to be working on it the rest of my life will somehow cause me to silence myself hmm. or to make a decision or do something that is out of integrity with myself because I'm afraid of being disliked. Wow. Brutally honest. And again, for the listener, what are you most scared of? Do you have the courage to be that honest? I wish this conversation could go on for a lot longer, but I have to honor your time and I have to honor the people that are signed up to come to the room in the next few minutes. But we are really on the verge. I didn't even get to ask you half of the things I wanted to ask you or three quarters of the things I wanted to ask you. What, what would you say to the world if you had two minutes to talk to it and you knew they were listening? What would you want to say to it and the people in the world? I can't remember if you'd already, if I was, if this was like my last lecture and, and I don't know if you'd already hit record when I started talking about the gap collapsing. Yeah. But the greatest advances in my own health, happiness and human potential have come when the gap, I learned to listen to myself and the gap between who I truly am and who the world told me I ought to be collapsed. And how did that happen for you? Surrendered in a puddle of snot and tears on the floor of my master bedroom closet. I was very ill. Um, I had, I had been um, riddled with eating disorders my whole life from the age of 11 to the age of 37. I know the day it ended, started and I know the day it ended. Um, suicidally depressed. But I couldn't do it because I was raised Catholic and I would bring shame upon my family because the worst thing, I was so concerned about what people thought of me. Spent my whole life worrying and wargaming and hypervigilant about what everybody thought of me. That gap was like this. Wow. And it made me living under that constant hypervigilance for, am I doing okay? Do people like me? Whatever. It actually created so much inflammation in my body that I had, you know, not only eating disorders and, and suicidally depressed, but also chronic fatigue, uh, systemic yeast, Lyme disease. I had dementia at 37, like brain fog so bad, like I had to carry a sticky note pad around with me and it was my heart external. I could go on about everything that was wrong with me. And when the white noise, cause that's just what it felt like to be Karen, you know, doing that. What yeah. do people think, you know? Um, but when I saw that it was actually doing that, that was making me so sick and I had to stop and face that somebody, I might actually disappoint somebody. Somebody might actually not like me. I thought I'd die, but I knew I couldn't keep doing that anymore. And I had to. And what I gained was myself. I met myself for the first time when I just said, pardon my language, fuck it. Yeah. Can't do it. Yeah. That gap went <clears throat> everything changed and my health actually on that day, the eating disorder went away on that day, three day, three weeks later, all that, I was totally gone. I was totally fine. All my symptoms went away. My mind came back in, in three weeks of collapsing that gap. Wow. It was a radical, it was a radical remission and kind of, that's what I, that's what I do. I want to thank you so much for being so honest and being here and sharing yourself so fully. I look forward to many more conversations with you and hope this isn't the last but the beginning. Um, I look forward to seeing what happens if anything happens, if we start to play together and how and invite you in to have to lead conversations or have conversations with people and bring them in as another person doing the same thing because I think you would have beautiful conversations with people. Um, I wanna thank the people who come here and listen. And I want to thank you especially for coming and listening to this show. And if you like this show and feel something from the show, share it with the people you like that didn't have a chance to hear it because that's what we do as a human species. When we like something, we tell people we like it about it. 
share it, not because this show, I'm wanting the show to grow, but because I want people to see how easy it is for strangers to come into a room and become friends. You know, when we live in a world where people are strangers, we live in a strange world. But when we live in a world where people are our friends, we live in a friendly world. And this world could sure use more friends. It could sure use a chance to be a friendlier world. I want to invite you, like I do every, every, every end of every show, to go out and find someone you don't know and invite them to have a conversation. Just listen to them. Again, you don't need to fix them, help them, change them, lift them, convert them, do anything. Just be there for them and listen to them by just asking, how are you doing? And let them tell you. And if they say good, fine, great, say, I get that. I appreciate that. But how are you really doing? Like, there's a lot going on. How are you doing? And let them tell you. Yeah. Karen, is there one last thing you want to share with people before you go? Or, and one last thing you want to say? <laughs> I wanted to thank you because it takes somebody to be that good at listening to draw out wisdom from others. So thank you. And, and I hope this becomes a, I wanted to say listening revolution, but it sounds more like a listening evolution I love that. for the world. I love so thanks that. for doing what you do. My, my absolute privilege and honor. And thank you for being one of the people that I've had the, the great honor to listen to. For those of you listening, thank you again. Um, until the next stranger comes into this room. Close the gap between who you are and who the world says you are and see what happens. <laughs> Allow yourself the possibility to not have to live for what other people think of you, but just to live your life being completely happy with who you are. Find that place where you are that. Get to know yourself. Get to know others. Love yourself. Love others. Forgive yourself. Forgive others. And until the next stranger walks into this room, be kind to each other, love each other, and be yourself with each other. Thank you so much for being here. Ciao.